Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I need some light, otherwise I don't see anything. Uh, some of you might have experienced Ben more before the last year. You know he was here as our... I'll tell you about that later. Uh, for those who didn't see him, um, maybe I'll, let me explain quickly what it's all about. Some places do have artists in residence. Some places have painters in residence. Some people have writers in residence. We at Cosmos do things differently, so we have a scientist at residence. Yes, and this was Ben Moore, I think so, yeah. And um, so we had the pleasure to uh, in have him hosting a couple of evenings. You know, he did, he did some talks like this. He did some very funny tea, uh, the tea parties up there, tea time with scones and with cucumber sandwiches and the whole shizzle. So it was, it was really, really funny to have him here over the year, and we got to love him dearly, and uh, so that's why we thought... And he's a natural show talent as well, which he didn't know before. So it's really, really good to have him. And so, so here we are. Um, today, ben will, show, ben, will, ben will show us places no man has ever stepped foot on. Some places you don't want to set foot on, like Venus or these places. They're horrible, horrible places. Because these places are really hot or, or very far away, and you will never reach. They never go back, get back. So the only place that's really nice is here. On Earth, and of course, it's Cosmos. Uh, <laughs> right, there you have it. Um, and he also will talk about, well, a couple of strange mails he gets. He puts them in the WTF file. You will, he will talk about that later. Uh, and also about the strange and odd behavior of one Mr. Elon Musk. But that's another story. So the next show you see uh, we'll have on um, the 18th of October, the 15th of November, and the 20th of December. And next year we'll all over the, over the place, I think, daily, I guess it will be. So my name is Rachel Bühler, you are at the Cosmos, you're in the Cosmos, and uh, now please welcome Professor Dr. Ben Moore. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Reto. Thank you, Cosmos, for hosting me and supplying me with alcohol. It's the only reason I'm here for the free drinks. OK, let me just start by testing the sound system. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. So every one of my talks will have a theme and sometimes related to the, the, the columns I write in the, in the Targi Magi in Das Magazine. And um, tonight's theme is poop and things that fall from space. <laughs> so where am I going to go with this? You'll have to see. There are some tenuous connections, but I'll try and string it together and to try and entertain you over the, the next six hours. So, no, oh, maybe just a bit less than that. But first, before we start, we have some breaking news. Because just last week, in my favorite week of the year, it was the Ig Nobel Prizes were announced. And this is really the highlight of the scientific year. It's much better than the Nobel Prizes, because these are research papers that really sound weird at first sight. They make you laugh, and then they make you think, and that's the idea of the Ig Nobel Prizes. So in, uh, I think it was last Thursday they were, they were announced, there were 10 awards at a ceremony in Harvard, and each of the awardees had a one-minute speech. And if they went over that, this annoying little eight-year-old girl would come on and say, please stop, I'm bored, please stop, I'm bored. <laughs> and if you, you can watch the, the video on YouTube of the event, and it really does stop everyone speaking after one minute. So it's a great way of, of, of cutting the talks down. But so I, I will just give you the highlights of some of these before we get into the main theme of the night. So let's just start off with the medicine 
Prize, which was a paper in the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association, the validation of a functional pilocalcial renal model for the evaluation of renal calculi passage while riding a roller coaster. Now, <laughs> what's that about? Well, the, the, the lead on this paper was Dr. Vartinger. He was he's a medical uh, practitioner. And one of his patients had come to him and said, Look, I, I went. To Disneyland, and I was on this roller coaster. And after I got off, I passed a kidney stone. And I thought, that, maybe that's a coincidence. So he got on it again, and he did the ride. And he, when he got back off, he passed another kidney stone. And he told this to, to the Dr. Vartinger, and then he was, he was interested. So Mr. Vartinger, he built a human model dummy, and he took it on roller coasters to see if it would actually pass the kidney stone. So he tried the big ones with the big drops like this, but that didn't work. What worked was the really old ones from the 1930s, which rattled and shaked. And that's what his prize was for in medicine, for showing that you, know, you can actually get rid of your kidney stones by having fun. So, the Economics Prize, this is great. It's a paper published in the Leadership Quarterly um, just this year called Writing a Wrong, Retaliation on a Voodoo Doll Symbolizing an Abusive Supervisor Restores Justice. And what, what they actually showed in that paper by, by testing people was that if you're really upset at somebody, it really helps pins in a doll. And I think we all knew that already. And there is one person I think most of the planet is upset about at the moment, and, and that's, that's this person here. Now... Tired of Trump? The Voodoo Donald Doll. It comes with pins, but it's more fun with a flamethrower. When it's crushed, showered in molten metal, Dropped from a plane. Run over by a train. Target practice. Smoothie. A mini hot tub full of acid. Steam rolled. Bulldozed. Tossed. Punched. Ripped. Flushed. Chopped up. Or blown up. Get your Voodoo Donald doll at TuckFrump.com. Oh dear, TuckFrump.com. Well, I think now we all feel a bit collectively better after watching that, so we can now get back to the, to the art of science. So the Chemistry Prize, this was great. This was a, a, very, a very nice paper published in Studies in Conservation. Human saliva as a cleaning agent for dirty surfaces. And what they showed by testing was that by spitting on anything, it led to a cleaner product afterwards than a commercial substance you could buy. And that, that's great, because then we can all save money. And um, they also concluded it was great just for you know, polishing up old artwork. And I, I like this one, because I, I did see some old artwork earlier in the, in the news this year, and, and it was an OK painting. Let's have a look at it. Yeah. This is Jesus Christ looking white um, and sold for let me 45 pounds in 1958 and then it was passed through some other artists it was in 2005 and then th those artists that bought it thought well wait a minute it looks a little bit like you know something famous like um Da Vinci's work, so they, they spat on it and polished it up, and then it ended up looking like that. That's amazing what you can do just by polishing up something you know, before, after. I, I don't know what happened to his mustache. I think they rubbed it off. <laughs> and his hair looks a lot better in the original, actually. And um, yeah, this was, this was um, bought by a Swiss collector, Yves Bouvier, um, for about 75 million a few years ago. And it was passed again through some more hands. And last year, it was, it was sold to some, um, someone in the, in the United Arab Emirates, a hydrocarbon dealer, bought it for $450 million. What? I wouldn't have paid more than 45 pounds for that, really, because it's a fake. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci, I mean, he, he, is, he was a genius, absolute genius. And he would not have made this basic mistake in this painting. 
you know, he invented lots of things. He, he wrote, he sculpted, he was an amazing painter. But he was most interested in optics. If you've ever read or seen any of his notebooks that, that have been um, in, in different libraries in the world, he would not have drawn a glass sphere that you could see straight through. Let's have a close look at that. That glass sphere looks just like a piece of a flat glass, but a glass ball, what he's holding here, would distort the light behind it. And there's no way that Leonardo da Vinci would have drawn that. Here are some examples from his notebooks of, of the optics passing through objects that he, that he drew. He, he, he loved optics. He actually, if you look at his books, it, there is a, a diagram of a telescope he invented, some people claim, 100 years before Galileo. So knowing the way that light behaves, I don't think there's any way. That's my bet. I, I wouldn't pay more than 45 quid for that painting anyway. But whatever, it's a, it's a nice picture. What about the next prize? Well, the literature prize. I think we've all undergone this sort of experience where, where we've, we've unpacked our IKEA furniture and, and, and then we've, you, know, you, you look at all the screws and, you, and the bits and then you look at the manual and you look at the bits and then you, you, know, you throw away the manual and then you just start. And then it all goes wrong. And this is common sense, but the Literature Prize was actually awarded for a paper published in Interacting with Computers called Life is Too Short to Read the Fucking Manual, well, to Read the Field Manual, How Users Relate to Documentation and Excess Features in Consumer Products. And they, did what, they, they proved what we all know, that people don't read the fucking manual. The Reproductive Medicine Prize. This was a great paper, an old one that they dug up to be awarded to these three uh, medical doctors. Nocturnal penile tumescence monitoring with stamps. So they did a study, and this is the paper here published. You know, well, it's in, I, I dug it up from PubMed, the archive, and, and read it. And well, it's a problem when you, you get a bit older, like me, and and, and so on. And, and you know, sometimes if you've got problems down here, you have to wear one of these devices at night to see if it's all working. And you know, if you have to strap that around it and wear that on your leg, you know, obviously it's not going to work, is it? So. <laughs> What these wonderful doctors got awarded the Ig Nobel Prize for is actually something much simpler, just a strip of stamps wrapped around it. And then you just look in your bed in the morning, and then you can determine what the activity was the, the night before. So brilliant. It's just genius. Genius. <laughs> so the next, yeah, the next one is um, the Nutrition Prize. This was, this was nice. Assessing the calorific significance of episodes of human cannibalism in the Paleolithic times. And I, I, I dug this paper out and I read it with interest. I was wondering if they were going to actually eat humans to test the, the calorific value of them or something. But no, they just did a, a back of the envelope calculation to show that humans are actually, they don't have as much calorific value as a typical fattened farm animal. And um, so that cannibalism didn't take, play a big role in our evolution through the Paleolithic times. So that was interesting. But what I found more interesting was when I applied this argument to an old movie. Uh, you might have seen this one, the 1973 movie uh, directed by Richard Fleischer called Silent Green. And it starred uh, Charlton Heston, a classic movie. It, it sets, you know, Filmed in 1973, it's set in a post-apocalyptic future where the greenhouse effect has caused chaos and there's no food left. And then at the end of the movie, people realize that they're actually eating other humans. And, and, and this green, these green biscuits called Soylent Green. And um, so I, I, I did a calculation here about the inefficiency of eating animals or humans. It's, it's a quite a simple calculation to see if the premise of the movie is correct. So. You know, animals eat, we eat about 2% of our body weight each day, and we're about 60% edible if you throw away the, you know, the bones and so on. So one adult human can feed another human for 30 days. That's just math, simple math. And if you want to fatten up a human such that they're then edible, then that's going to take about five years if you really feed them a lot, and then you can, you can eat them. Um, and if you just assume a linear growth rate, then to feed that one, to fatten that one human requires 30 other humans. So that's an inefficiency of 30. And uh, the conclusion there, using Soylent Green as a food, the entire population of humans would be reduced to zero people in four generations. But 
as you know, since I like to pass on my ethical concerns about our diets, then this is also the inefficiency of, of, of eating animals, albeit a factor of the calorific content, a factor of two, and, and the use of hormones and drugs get that, gets that down to about a factor of seven or eight or so. And the reason for that is that you know, eating plants, the, the, the reason that it's more efficient to eat plants than, than animals is that animals just, they move around and think, and that's where the extra energy comes from, whereas a plant just stands there. So, <laughs> That, that's, that, that's the basic physics of, or the science of, of, of eating stuff. The Biology Prize, The Scent of the Fly, published um, on, the, on the Bio Archive, actually. This, this was a nice one, and it reminds me to top up my, my wine here, because what... Is that really empty? No, it can't be empty already. <laughs> believe it. Now there's another bottle there, that's good. So what, what this paper showed was that wine experts, they can sniff a wine and tell if there's a single fruit fly has been in it. And it's, that, that's quite amazing because you, you can't smell a fruit fly normally, but it turns out that the female fruit fly emits a pheromone called Z411A1, and it's in the molecular doses, it's tiny, and it's, it's the level that a dog could smell that, that we shouldn't be able to, but for some reason we've evolved this ability to smell this fly's pheromone, and, and that's fascinating, so a wine taster can actually just, just smell it there. So that was one of the other prizes. I found that quite interesting. So, and then the last one I'll talk about is the Medical Education Prize here. Colonoscopy in the sitting position, lessons learned from self-colonoscopy using a small caliber various stiffness colonoscope. And I think a picture is worth a thousand words here. <laughs> yeah. For those who are embarrassed about having someone else do that to you. So that, this is where I can trans pose into the theme of tonight's talk on poop. And we'll start off with poop as pollution. And you'll see where I'm leading with all of this when we get to things that fall from space later on. So back in the 19th century, it was a big problem. Most of the big cities in the world had tens of thousands of horses pulling cargo, pulling humans, and the streets were literally lined with horse poo. It was a major concern. In 1894, the Times of London said that, you know, within 50 years, every street in London will be buried under nine feet of manure. And this was a major problem at the time. And I, I was, you know, being in Switzerland for quite a while now and knowing, knowing the Swiss, I was curious as to if, you know, did the Bahnhofstrasse look like this in 1894? Well, of course not. Look at it. <laughs> but it, look, there is a little bit of poo down here. That's shocking, shocking. But this is the busiest area in Zurich, and in, in, uh, this was taken in, yeah, um, 1895. Outside the cosmos at the time, it was spotless. <laughs> not, a, not a speck. Other streets, you know, they even invented the tram as a, as a way to get around using horses, whereas the rest of the world were just suffering, knee-deep in horse poo. And when a horse died, they just left it there on the side of the street. It was, it was really a major concern. And that's what led to the rise of the automobile, because it was proposed that people should buy cars to cut down on pollution. And this is the first car advert. <laughs> Dispense with a horse and save the expense and care and anxiety of keeping it. Uh, so it's the Winton motor carriage. And um, it does, uh, yeah, 20 miles an hour. And the hydrocarbon motor is simple and powerful. No odor, no vibrations. And, and this was proposed as a way to get around the, the, the problem with all the horses. And, well, it didn't work in, in, in Zurich, of course, because we didn't like cars, we still don't like cars, and the trams used to hunt them down and, and, and squish them. So I don't know how they could do that, but <laughs> I don't know how that would happen. But the rest of the world seems to have, you know, we, we've got to this point where we, we're, we now suffer pollution from the cars. So if we had stuck with the horses, we could have actually used that horse poop for 
a source of energy, actually. So that's the next little topic. Poop is a source of energy. And you know, those remarkable British people, we'll meet one of them in a second in, in a little video clip, invented last, uh, just earlier this year a, a light that was powered by dog poo. And it's very simple. You, you collect your dog poo, you put it into a little container at the bottom of the light, you turn the handle, and then it generates gas that light the light. But I've got a little video here. You can meet the amazing inventor that invented this. Let's see if I can start that. Now, news of a revolutionary new fuel being trialled in Worcestershire. Apologies if you're eating your tea, but brace yourself. This new fuel is dog poo. This really is a scoop for our science correspondent, David Gregory Kumar, who's been to Malvern to investigate. In a Malvern workshop, an inventor at work, <laughs> and he's working on powering street lamps with dog mess. This is deadly serious, so we spent uh, two and a half years working on this in secret um, to get the engineering and the science correct with it, which is what we've done. And now Mr Harvey is ready to reveal his prototype to the world. Lift up the, this dispenser and grab a free bag. So serious. You can have one, two, three, however many you want. So we then scoop that into the bag this this is the biodigester this is all that the public needs to deal with which is the the hopper at the front of it and all you do is lift up that top cover the back the whole bag it, nothing is emptied goes in there on top of the other bags that are inside and then you rotate this handle five times anti-clockwise because that Seven, is an eight, auger nine, that pushes ten, the bag 11, down into 12. the biodigester behind and yeah. that's enough to light this lamp? Oh yes, because we collect the gas <laughs> in a gasometer here and you can see this floating gasometer here is is got about 50 litres of bio um, gas inside it. We then will fire up the lantern and the mantle shines and we go light this whole area for about uh, two hours or so. Brilliant. And already the poo-powered light is attracting visitors. Okay, so well, I'm, I'm going to see it. And we're it's too much. But the next thing they've invented is even better in Britain. You've got to give it to these clever Brits. When, when they leave the EU, they're going to just be doing so well by marketing all these brilliant and um, good luck to them. This, this, is, this, was, uh, this, is, this is a bus that they developed earlier this year. It's the Bio bus, and it's actually powered by human waste, so human poo. And um, I don't know if what's painted on the outside is what it looks like on the inside, but it's pure genius. Love it. One tank of gas powers the bus for 300 kilometers. So you can use, you know, in, in India and other developing countries in the last century, Animal poo was, was used as an energy source for a long time, actually. The next topic I'd like to talk about related to this is the art of poop. Because poop can be a pollution, it can be energy, it can also be art. And this is, this is the art, this is the Italian artist, Piero Manzoni. His father told him, your work is shit. And he didn't like that. You know, no, no artist likes being told their work, their work is, is, is crap. So he, his father ran a meat tinning factory. So he paid his father back by creating an artwork that was meant to be a sort of mockery of the art world, of artists, of, of critics, and, and of his father. And his work comprised of 90 tin cans reportedly filled with his poop, 30 grams of the feces. And on, on, the, on the cans, it, it's, it's, he signed each one, and it's, these were made in 1961, called Artist Shit, contents 30 grams, freshly pre preserved, produced and tinned in May 1961 in three languages. So when he made these, he sold them at the price of gold, 30 grams of gold, which in 1961 was $37 each. The Tate Gallery bought tin number four in, in the year 2000, and it just describes it, a tin can with paper wrapping with unidentified contents. 
And this, this you know, Manzoni, is, is, he, he died uh, a few years ago, but the, the joke sort of backfired. Rather than a mockery, it's now worth a fortune. In 2015, Tin 54 was sold for 200,000 euros. <laughs> I'm not making this up. So there are rumors on the internet that some of the cans have exploded because you know when, when you've got stuff like that inside of a tin can, it tends to produce gases and blows up. But no one, given the value of them now, nobody would dare open one today because that would ruin the artwork. So it's just genius, genius. Um, but back in 1989, when, when they were still not so expensive, um, somebody did open one of these. The, the, the French artist uh, Bernard Basile opened one in, in 1989 and exhibited it, opened to the world. And what did he find inside? He opened it and he looked inside and there was another little tin, <laughs> little sealed tin inside the tin. But he didn't go further, he just left it like that. So we still do not know what's inside those cans of artists' poop. So poop can be art, worth a lot of money. It can also be beautiful, the beauty of poop. I think maybe some of you in the summer have been to some beautiful beaches like this and were lying there in the sun, enjoying life. Did you know that you're actually lying on a beach that's made completely 100% of poop? No? And here's some little videos of them swimming around in, in, in the ocean here. And as they swim around, they're, they're eating food and they're pooping out what is basically 100% white sand, and that is what you're lying on, on those nice beaches. Where does it come from? Well, the parrotfish, they, they eat the coral. Now, if you've ever tried eating coral, I don't advise it because your teeth will break and fall out, but a parrotfish can do that. They can crunch it up, eat it, get the minerals, and then they poop out the white stuff that you then sunbathe on. How do they do that? This was just discovered last year in the, in, in the American Chemistry Journal. We published a paper here describing what parrot teeth are made of. And, and they measured the competition and how they could actually chew up on, on coral. And they have more than a thousand teeth arranged in 15 rows. a bit like a shark. And on a microscopic level, they're made of little crystals of fluoropatite, which is very hard, very resistant mineral that can be used to grind up the coral. So that's just some food for thought um, for, the, for your next vacation. I'm sure you'll remember this talk. <laughs> um, oh yeah, sorry. I need to have a break every now and again. Oh, one down. No, I didn't start that bottle, so don't blame me if this all goes wrong. The physics of pooping. This, this, this is quite funny. This was a paper published in the journal Soft Matter called The Hydrodynamics of Defecation. And it, I think this will make the Ig Nobel Prizes next year. I'm surprised it didn't this year. So that, that, the authors of this paper, they asked fluid dynamicists, we joined forces with colorectal surgeon Daniel Chu and two undergraduates who filmed animals pooping and handpicked 34 mammalian species Zoo Atlanta in order to measure the density and viscosity to try and understand how it all works. And they learned what was one of their main conclusions was that elephants and other herbivores create things that float, whereas carnivores create more smelly, stinky things. So that was interesting. And they also placed the, the resulting mess in a little device called a rheometer, a blender that measures the properties of, of, of the resulting things. And then but the main conclusion was quite interesting, but um, just look away if you don't like to see this, but this is an elephant pooping, and they, they took videos, and now you're going you're gonna to see what the, the main conclusion was. This was a, a little dog pooping here, and this is, this is all this supplementary material in the journal that I can just download. So I didn't go out and film this myself. So, this, this is their supporting evidence for their main result. And then they filmed a panda here. Just, uh, these, are, these are creatures of many different sizes. And then they filmed uh, this little warthog here. And what did they find after these poor undergraduates? I mean, what did they tell their friends when they're at parties? What, what did you do for your summer job? Well, yeah, I worked in a shop. So when, when they put all this together, 
they, they, they made a plot of the duration, the length of time you need to go to the loo versus the mass of the animal. And they found that it was a constant. This is remarkable because there's a, there's a, a, a thousand times the mass difference between an elephant and a cat, but every creature, including humans, takes about 10 seconds to poop. And that's quite remarkable because the volume of an elephant's poop is a thousand times larger than that of a cat. So how can this be constant? So they went further, they dug deeper, and, and then you get to some interesting science. So they, they found that the, um, the, the, there's, a, there's a really slippery lining on the inside of your intestine that becomes thicker with the bigger animals, and that allows, the, at the same pressure, stuff to flow out at the same rate. And that, that's the mucus lining. And what they did with that was they entered a competition run by NASA to develop a spacesuit that enabled astronauts to, you, you know, perform bodily functions in space when they're in a spacesuit for a week at a time. And they, these scientists that did this research were semi-finalists in the NASA Space Poop Challenge. So what's the NASA Space Poop Challenge? Well, they, this is a great idea. It was a competition a year or two ago where they sought solutions. They didn't have one. If an astronaut is in space for a week at a time, uh, in a spacesuit, then how would you get rid of all of that stuff? And they, they didn't have an answer, so they, they, they made some rules for the competition, and the prize was $30,000. Solutions that should allow for a, a liter of urine per day for six days, etc. They gave very specific amounts, and the research of those scientists working on, on, on the, how animals poop allowed them to develop a diaper that would work very efficiently in space. This is the poster. I love NASA posters for the competition. There were 20,000 competitors, 150 teams, and um, they, got, they had all of these people working, thinking of concepts for a measly $30,000. I mean, they had, a, yeah, that's, that's just genius. And um, yeah, and we're going we're gonna to come back to this with a guest I have in the show um, in, a, in a little while because we, we're going to see firsthand an example of, of one of these space diapers later on. So don't run away yet. So poop in the sky. This, this will connect together in, in, a, in a sort of cool way, I hope. Um, so I took this. This is the Milky Way. And it's a, it's a movie I made. I took this last month during the Pleiades meteor shower. And I, I just set my camera up with a fisheye lens, taking an exposure a minute lo along for, for four hours during the Pleiades meteor shower. And you can see several, you can see meteor trails, you can see some aeroplane and satellite trails. The meteors are tending to run downwards. There's one that created a, its own explosion in the atmosphere, if you saw that. Um, and that's the Milky Way passing uh, across the night sky. So what's this got to do with poop in space? Well, I think the best person to answer that is the astronaut Chris Hadfield. When you go to the bathroom on Earth, you're relying on gravity pretty, pretty heavily. Imagine if you were halfway done and there were, somebody shut off gravity, it would be a mess. And you'd float off the toilet. So. <laughs> So when we, when we designed our space toilet, first it has to have a seat belt on it to hold you down. And then we decided to separate solids and liquids because they're easier to store that way. So we just have a tube that you pee into and it has air pulled into the tube. So it's not a big deal. For the women, there's a cup fits up against them. For the guys, it's just like a little funnel. You just pee into this tube and it goes into a, into a sewage tank. But the solids that come out of your body, that's a harder problem to solve. And it's an important medical one, because on Earth, everything falls on the floor. But in space, it's going to float around. <laughs> so so it, it'll really make you sick. If you re-ingest something that came out of your body, it will really make you sick. And we can't afford to get that sick. So we designed a toilet that instead of gravity pulling everything into the toilet, it has air flow. There's air pulled down into the toilet, sort of windy when you're sitting there, but it pulls everything out of your body. Everything that comes out of your body gets pulled down into the toilet by the air. And then in the storage tank, 
we just expose that to the vacuum of space. So it basically just freeze dries everything, so it kills all the bacteria, so that there's no smell. And then that, that, we just store it. And then when you have a whole bunch of it stored, we put it in a little unmanned supply ship, and we undock it, and it burns up in the atmosphere. So the next time you see a beautiful shooting star going across the sky, <laughs> that's what it might be. <laughs> Doesn't that ruin it when you're standing outside? <laughs> oh, dear, dear. So, yeah, when, yeah, and, and well, I, yeah. <laughs> It's hard to follow up on that. There's a, there's a sort of dumbed down version that, like, what you see in the American news, which I'd like you to watch as well, because it, it, it's kind of it, it's a different look at the same topic. It's a question you've probably pondered, but we're too afraid to ask out loud. What happens to astronaut poop? We finally know. NASA is celebrating the halfway point of its year in space mission by sharing some interesting tidbits about what spending an entire year in space will do to the human body. Here's one lovely detail. Astronaut Scott Kelly will produce 180 pounds of poop during his year on the International Space Station. And all those pounds of poop burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. NASA says they look like shooting stars. I know what you're thinking. Have I ever made a wish on a shooting turd? It gets better. The space agency also noted that Kelly will drink 730 liters of recycled urine and sweat while he's on the ISS. So for all you kiddos out there who dream of being an astronaut, dream on. Because one day, your poop could also be a shooting star. For Newsbeat Social, I'm Molly Real. How to inspire the next generation of astronauts, American way. Okay, so... We're sort of at the halfway point, it's time for a drink, and we're going to have a little break for 10 minutes to allow you to get a drink, and then we're going to move to the next topic, things that fall from space that are not... We're moving to things that are heavy, rocks and, and so on. But after the break, we have a special guest, uh, Guido Schwartz, and we're going to discuss some artifacts that have been into space. He's brought some examples of things that astronauts wear, so we'll chat with Guido for... 15 or so minutes, and then we'll finish off the show with some highlights from the week of Elon Musk and his ventures. So let's have a, a 10, let's have a 15-minute break, and then we'll start again. So, oh. welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and it's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome onto the stage. Guido Swatch. She, Guido. Hi, Ben. Hello. Guido, Guido is a, a, an old friend and colleague. We, we work together in a collaboration, um, an NCCR network based on understanding exoplanets and life out there. And Guido does a lot of the media communication. But what, he's, what, what he is, um, has been trying to do and is setting it up now in Switzerland is something quite remarkable. It's, it's the Swiss Space Museum, and, and Guido is the founder of the Swiss Space Museum, and I'm on the board of directors of that together with uh, astronaut Claude Nicolia and others, and I'm tr we're trying to help find a permanent home for his exhibition. Guido, when I first went to his home, I was like, Every room is filled with amazing things. Original space stuff that's flown on different missions, on the Apollo missions. And Guido is one of the gr world's great collectors of space artifacts. Memorabilia that is really, it must be worth a fortune. You must be worth millions by now, Guido. Yes, and I'm poor <laughs> because of that. <laughs> and uh, if you're interested, the website is, is here for more information. If you want to be involved, then contact Guido. It's a, it's a great project to, to bring a home to his exhibition and to, more, to, to make space available to the public. But today, Continuing on the topic we started, before we move on to other topics, um, I asked Guido to bring in just some things from his, his collection and that, that might be relevant to the theme of tonight. So, Guido, the floor yes. is yours for a few minutes. Uh, thank you. So, uh, I thought I'd bring some stuff that really fits to your topic. <clears throat> it's not used. <laughs> but I have to wear these gloves because Original stuff is always very delicate. So, 
Yeah, you see here, this is an actual space suit. They, they wear these uh, to fly into space. But what you don't see is what they have underneath it. it is that why you're wearing these white gloves? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> this is always, I, I work sometimes in Bern, and this is a long travel from Zurich to Bern, so I <laughs> always put these on. No. <laughs> the, these are actual, uh, it, it's, I'm sorry, there is a stain on it, but it's not used. But you can see here inside, it's, it's quite good absorbing. <laughs> And you, you, uh, you ask yourself, wh why do they need this stuff? Well, when you wear this suit, uh, then uh, you, you, it takes about one hour until you're ready to go. And uh, maybe you, you switch the... Yes, you see, they sit like this in their chair. Uh, knee pads strapped on, so you, you sit like this. And when you want to fly to the ISS, it takes you between 8 and 18 hours, usually. So they sit like this for this time, so never complain again when you fly economic uh, to somewhere, to holiday when you can lay on the poop uh, beach. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, and uh, there you need this, because uh, if, you, if you switch it, you see here, this is the Soyuz uh, uh, capsule, the, mi the middle part. Here you see where two people sit in. Uh, usually there sit three, and you have the, the living module. This is uh, only used to fly there and to fly back, uh, but usually they sit there. If you switch the picture, it's not a lot of room. So you see, when you sit there, you don't uh, go off your seat uh, every minute. <laughs> so it's better you wear this diaper. Of course, when, when, you, when you make spacewalks, you also have stuff like this. Not the blue one, but a yellow one. It's nice to have different colors. Uh, it's, it's funny. It's. Um, Disposal UCD. It's a, it's a, a device for urine, a urine collect, uh, collective device. You wear this like a belt. You, you go in, and then you can see here, there you put uh, something like a condom. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can pee do, uh, while you are working on the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. <laughs> And nobody sees. It's like when you when you are in the uh, in the swimming pool, you can <laughs> pee and nobody <laughs> finds out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that brings me to uh, Alan Shepard. Alan Shepard was the the very first American to fly into space. He he uh, launched about uh, a month uh, or three weeks after Gagarin, and his flight. Maybe you. Uh, bring up this one. It's it was only a 15-minute flight, so uh, not uh, you you didn't have to think about go to the toilet. They thought, <laughs> but uh, when he was strapped in, they had technical problems with the with the rocket, and it took time, and there were one hour, two hours, three hours, and at one point he he said. Listen, guys, I had coffee this morning. <laughs> I should pee. And uh, they said, well, we, we can't get you out of the capsule because uh, this uh, would postpone the, the launch for one day. So he said, OK, what do I have to do? Uh, hold it. And I can't anymore. He was sweating. And uh, then he said, look, I want to pee into the suit. And they said, wait a second, we have to see if there is a connector inside which could cause some problems. With, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they, they looked at it and there was no problem, so he peed into his suit. So uh, he laid there like this for the whole flight, laying in the pee. <laughs> By the way, cheers, Ben. <laughs> it's also yellow. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. When you go on a longer travel, you need food. <laughs> I 
hope you had a nice dinner tonight. And uh, they also had drinks. Maybe you switched. Uh, yeah, the orange drink, the famous orange drink. Um, I brought also a nice thing with me. It's this one here, Tang. It's called Tang. It's unfortunately, uh, somebody drank it already, but <laughs> it's not worth because it smells like a uh, And they had the same thing you could buy the, on, on Earth. They had the same thing uh, on board to, on the Apollo missions. And uh, one astronaut had, had really problems with that. And I, I don't know if you have the audio. Uh, yeah, yeah we, we, no, we can, we can see it. here is also a, an ad with Tang. So they, you see life support system of an astronaut. There belongs also Tang to it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have, the, I have the audio. Yeah, maybe yeah. you bring up the audio. This was John Young on Apollo 16. Okay, and I sure think it's paying off. You guys did an outstanding job. I got the parts again. I got them again, Charlie. I, mean, I haven't eaten this much citrus fruit in 20 years. And I'll tell you one thing. In another 12 fucking days, I ain't never eaten any more. I put them up over the... Right up in there. They ain't there? Oh, shit. Orion, Houston. Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay, Tanya, where you have a hot mic? How long have we had that? <laughs> hot mic means everybody could listen to it. <laughs> so it wasn't really, really nice. So maybe you, you go back to the... Yes, uh, one, one more back, please. If you had to poop on the lunar missions on the way to the moon, you used these bags. And they... Uh, they had some uh, something like glue on it on this side, and when you switch to the other, you can see <laughs> like it was placed. Of course, you you wouldn't have the, the trousers on. <laughs> but uh, as we heard before, it's it's you you don't have gravity, so there was a, a thing you could go in with your hand and help a little bit. <laughs> but that yeah, a little bit like Robbie Dog, yes. But that, that was not, not all. Afterwards, when, you, when everything was in, in the bag, <laughs> which was not always the, the thing, <laughs> then you had uh, to put in uh, a small pill uh, and squeeze your stuff to uh, kill the bacteria. So uh, this was very nice. <laughs> You can go on. <laughs> yeah, and uh, this, this is uh, from Apollo 10. Uh, you see, that, that was a time when uh, some stuff didn't go into the bag. <laughs> so uh, where did that come from? Oh, give me a napkin. <laughs> this was uh, the, the audio transcript. Everything they said on the moon was transcripted. So also this stuff. Unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't find the audio. <laughs> I think it was fun. <laughs> OK, let's go to the. <laughs> I, need, I need a sip of wine. You need some drink. You need some, we all need a drink mm. after that. <laughs> if you maybe can change. <laughs> yeah. Uh, being in space is not always fun. This is the crew of uh, Gemini 7. This is Jim Lovell, later Apollo 13 commander, and this is Frank Borman. He was the commander on Apollo 8 later. Those uh, two guys were uh, meant to go on a, on a mission for two weeks in a Gemini capsule. You see? It's a two-seater, not a lot of space. And if you change the picture again, you see there's really not a lot of room. And imagine now being into that capsule for two weeks together. Just like me and you together in a telephone. Yeah. <laughs> 
And then you were there and uh, Frank Borman uh, told Jim Lovell, listen, I won't poop on this mission. <laughs> I don't do that next to you. And uh, he could hold it for four days. <laughs> and then he had to, <laughs> to do it. <laughs> and you sit there and you, your, your colleague sits, ne sits next to you. You pull down uh, the suit and then you try somehow to, to poop. Yeah, and when they came back, uh, next picture, please. They, they looked really <laughs> horrible. And uh, I, I uh, talked once to a guy who was uh, there on the recovery when they opened the hatch. <laughs> the smell was really amazing. <laughs> so, what do we have? Yes, uh, other stuff, other interesting stuff. Um, I can show you that. It's not, there are no children here, no. I have uh, a calendar girl here. <laughs> and why did I bring that? It's not space stuff <laughs> somehow, but it's related to this. This is the, uh, uh, the glove of, uh, of Neil Armstrong. And as you can see, on the glove they had uh, the checklist, what they had to do on the moon. So. On Apollo 11, there was not much to do than uh, one experiment, the Swiss experiment, by the, by the way, the first which was set up. And uh, then uh, taking some samples and other stuff. But later on, as you can see on the next missions, they had more to do, so it didn't fit just on the globe. So they had these uh, little books, uh, cough checklists, and when you go to the next picture, you see it here on your arm, so you could uh, go through. And uh, the funny thing was, um, on Apollo 12, uh, the backup crew put some extra pictures in it. And the guys didn't know that, and they were on the moon. Imagine you're on the moon. This is also not really imaginable. You're standing there, you're doing your experiments, you do this, and you see a picture like this, or the next one. <laughs> <laughs> and they stood there, the, the, the only two men on the moon, looking at that on the moon, they were laughing loud out. And in Houston they asked, hey, wh wh what's so funny up there? <laughs> and as they had a, a hot mic, <laughs> they couldn't say what they saw, so they had to invent something. <laughs> so you, uh, you can show, there are, yeah, you see, quite nice. Oh, and. <laughs> These were the two guys on the moon. They had these books, and uh, the backup crew was really nice. So they have had also something for the guy who was up in the capsule uh, flying around the moon. So uh, they put him this calendar girl uh, in. Maybe you, no, you can. No, I can't go on this. <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> it's not safe for work. No? Really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Guido, and <laughs> that was fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's very safe. It's safe. It's, it's very safe. safe. So. You have these in your collection. These must be very expensive, these well, pieces. Actually, uh, um, this is not the original that, that went to the moon. I tried to acquire it in an auction, <laughs> and I stopped when it was at 5,000 or something like this. Then I stopped, and yeah. it went for like uh, $12,000. Hey, it went to the moon. Yeah, so, yeah, the items that have been to the moon are it's incredibly expensive. It's really expensive. I have, yeah. I have a Swiss flag flown on Apollo 15 which was also nice. Maybe time for the last? Last one. Last That's one. What have you got? So uh, this is a, a moon globe I brought. And uh, it's funny, it's, uh, it's made of metal. It's nice, uh, made in, uh, in uh, 1963. And the funny thing of that is when you turn it around, on the backside, you don't have anything because in 1963, they didn't have really 
great pictures from the moon from the backside. Uh, this was the first probe, a Russian one, and if you go to the next picture, this was the first picture that was taken from the backside of the moon. Uh, they saw already this uh, black spot, this was a really huge uh, crater there, and uh, maybe the next picture. Uh, this is uh, the American probe, this is a uh, lunar orbiter, and on the next picture you can see this was the first uh, Earth rise, where you also can see a little bit of the backside of the moon. But most of the backside wasn't known at that time. So, and this was made in 1963. In 1960 they started to plan the lunar landings. So they didn't know much about the moon, but they already wanted to go there. Thank you, Guido. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Guido Schwartz, thank you very much for coming on tonight. That was always fascinating. Whenever I talk to Guido, he's, he's full of fascinating stories about space. He's a, he's a wealth of information, absolutely. So, it's time, it's that time of night to have a drink. Thank you, Reto, for filling two bottles here, and if I can make it through the rest of the 20 minutes, then I'm happy. So, we're at that time of night that we're going to talk about my favorite person, my hero, the hero of every nerd on the planet, Elon Musk. This is, of course, you may have seen it in one of the previous shows, one of his wonderful... Um didn't work so well, did it? It's eye on Elon time. It's the regular feature, also known to the regulars as, what the fuck has Elon been tweeting about this month? <laughs> now, if, if you don't know who Elon Musk is, I don't know where you've been for the last few years, but let me just give you a recap of Elon and his plans for world domination. So he got a, he got a degree in physics in 1992, and then he started his PhD, uh, and, but he dropped out after two days. He thought, this isn't, this isn't worth, you know, life can be better. So he founded a, a company, a web company called Zip2, which he, he, he sold just a few years after for $22 million. And then he founded a new company with the proceeds of that called X.com. It was an online banking company, which he then he, he, he merged it together with a company called Confinity, um, which then went on to create PayPal, which he sold for 1.5 billion in 2002 to eBay. And with that wealth, he then went on to to, to fund a, a host of new startups and enterprises, including you know, Tesla Automobile Company, SpaceX, the Hyperloop, and ma many other things. And uh, he's, he's a remarkable guy, and, and, I, and I love him to bits. And I, but I can't help to, but to make a little bit of fun of him, too, because, you know, why not? Life is short. So, um, in addition to all these all these businesses he's started in 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 the, in the last you know decade he's also you know he, he he set up a company to sell flamethrowers which is fun and um you know this is uh this is the boring company he started to build high speed transport between cities and and he's uh developed this flamethrower he sold 20,000 of them last year for $500 each and i was wondering why he'd actually built this thing but when 
Just a, you know, a few weeks ago, you might have seen in the news that Elon was you know, famously lighting up a, a joint on, 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 in the radio station, and he was using his flamethrower. That's why he developed a flamethrower. So he, he smoked some pot online, live, in front of a, an audience, and that is the most expensive joint ever smoked in history because Tesla sh shares, Tesla, the car company, is worth, it has a market cap of about 40 billion, and it dropped 6%. So that joint costs, it costs one billion dollars to smoke that. <laughs> That's why we love Elon. He doesn't. He doesn't care, and um, and we still love him, even though he's you know he's a terrible guy. He's being sued by British cave divers in in Thailand and all sorts of other things, but. Um, He's inspirational, and he's, he's suffering on all fronts. He's getting sued from, as I said, from a Thai cave diver, and he's, he's um, you know, with his tweets. He's a bit like Donald Trump. He gets into trouble all the time. You, you should not tweet. I, I refuse to have a Twitter account because I would get into trouble immediately by tweeting the wrong thing, being inappropriate, just like Elon and, and, and Mr. Trump. Anyway, he's having trouble. He's, um, the, the, the latest battle is between Kalashnikov and the Boring Company. And it's going to be a, quite a face-off because um, you wonder what has AK-47s got to do with Elon Musk? Well, Kalashnikov, famous for Russian very efficient weapons, have announced that they're going to take on Elon Musk in the automobile business and produce cooler, more efficient electric cars. And uh, so now there's going to be a, a big fight between Elon and his flame, frame uh, flower here. But um, if, if you look at the Kalashnikov vehicle, you know, you can really, you, 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 I don't know who's going to win this competition. You know, you, Tesla cars are quite cool, but Kalashnikov cars, well, they're great. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> who would not want to be seen driving in this vehicle? And it's not only that. Kalashnikov are expanding not only in the electric car business, but also, they, they, I think, um, for some reason, Star Wars has just reached Russia, and, um, and Kalashnikov have, have, have just released this sort of robotic death monster killer robot. <laughs> <laughs> So they're really they're arming up against against Elon Musk and his flamethrower empire, and and thanks to all of this, the 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 European Union, um, the, the 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 Parliament in in the EU voted to ban killer robots actually, which is a good thing because you know the power to decide on life and death should never be taken out of human hands and given to machines, and that is a great idea. You should not do that. Apart from all of those countries that you love to hate, like Israel, Russia, South Korea, and America, oppose this because they want to develop these. They, they went against this common sense rule because they, they want to develop the advantages of autonomous weapons systems, and that is a bad thing. So that, anyway, there's so much news. Every day there is about two or three news things about Elon, and I could go on for, for, for hours about it, and I'm just picking out some of the highlights from the last week now. And um, just on Monday this week, Elon announced his first space tourist. So if you saw that, um, he's, that's on his back is the Japanese billionaire, Yusaka Maisawa. And Yusaka Maisawa is, a, is a, one of the richest Japanese people. And he's paid in advance Elon Musk quite a fortune for a, a tourist trip. And the, the trip is uh, to take uh, Yusaka around the moon. It's a one-week journey to travel in Elon Musk's rocket around the moon. And he wants to take several artists with him. It, it's a very noble idea, actually. He wants to take six artists traveling around the moon, which hasn't been done since the 1970s, to paint the vision of the moon, what you feel in space, to inspire humanity again. Because we haven't been inspired like that. And that's what, that's what we love about Elon. He, he tries to enable inspirational things as well as fucking up a lot of the time. But um, now, it's in how much did he pay for that? Now, the, the Apollo missions to the moon, you know, they cost hundreds of billions of dollars. And Elon Musk, well, we, we don't know. He didn't say how much. What he did say, it was more than the artwork he bought a few years ago. So Yusaku, Yusaku is, a, is an art collector, and uh, he, he, 
he paid $110 million for this thing. Uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat's uh, 1982 untitled work. And um, I would pay good money not to hang that on my wall. <laughs> But uh, the, he paid um, Elon Musk several times that amount, and we're guessing it's about the level of $300 million, maybe even more for this journey. And Elon Musk is going to take him around the moon in his BFR. If you remember from the la one of the last shows, BFR is, stands for Big Fucking Rocket, and that is his artist rendition of the Big Fucking Rocket. And the problem is, the journey is going to take place in 2023, and um, this is an artist's rendition, and it's yet to be built. So, you know, it's ambitious. It's hard. Space is hard, and Elon Musk is very ambitious. And if he can manage this, then, you know, good for him. Well done. I think it's really great. And he, you know, Elon has got many, he's many ambitious projects. He's like, you know, this one here, SpaceX will get you to Mars by 2030. Yeah, fuck yeah, that's going to be fantastic. You know, it costs $500 billion to land people on the moon. Elon Musk is worth about, well, if you add up SpaceX plus Tesla, you know, maybe 40 or $50 billion. So he's about a factor of 10 away from that. But he is making good progress because if you remember a tweet from earlier uh, this year, he, he, he said, I'm going to send my car in advance to Mars. So there's a vehicle there for the Martians to use. Destination is Mars orbit. It'll be you know, orbiting Mars for a billion years if it doesn't blow up. And it didn't blow up. It was an amazingly successful launch. And it's beautiful. He launched his bloody car into space with a, with a fake astronaut in it. And that is a real picture with the Earth in the background. Genius. It, it's, it, it really is spectacular. And, and in, in the last late science show that I gave here in the cosmos, there happened to be some Blick journalists in the audience listening to my blah on Elon Musk. And they picked up on that and they published it in the headlines the fucking day after. And if you're in the audience tonight, <laughs> I'm going to get out. <laughs> because they. They asked me, who would I send into space? And, and you know, it's a joke. You know, I'm British, so I make jokes. I shouldn't do that. But I said I would send Donald Trump and Putin together in the car. <laughs> Next time, I, I will try not to, to say anything inappropriate. But I really would. So Elon, he, he, he launched from Earth his Tesla Roadster towards Mars. And um, that was brilliant. And it, where is it now? Well, some astronomers have actually looked for it in space. And uh, this is, a, this is um, some observations from some, uh, with, you know, using a big telescope. They're looking out, and there it is. It's traveling there amongst the stars. I mean, <laughs> it's a star. It's super. Who oh, no. There it goes. Where, the, where is Elon Musk's car right now? Well, OK, now, the, the, now there's some dynamics here. So it was launched here in February this year. And it was on this orbit, the Tesla Roadster. And it actually missed Mars. It didn't go into orbit about Mars. It missed and went on into space. And the wonderful thing about orbits and dynamics is when, when something goes around and you send it off from a certain place, it's, it's like if you're in a spaceship and you throw some poo out the window, it's probably going to come back and hit you in, in another orbit, because that's how gravitation works. So if you look at that orbit, it's destined to come back around to Earth's orbit in the future. So it didn't actually make it to Mars, it missed. And uh, some, of, some, of, um, some of our colleagues actually were interested in what happens to this spacecraft in, in the future with Elon Musk's car. So they wrote a paper on it in a scientific journal called The Random Walk of Cars and Their Collision Probabilities with Planets. And this is an interesting question because gravity is a, is a complicated problem. What Isaac Newton solved in the, in the 17th century was the gravity of two objects. And Isaac Newton worked really hard. And one of his biggest failings in the Principia, which you've all read at high school, I know that because you, you taught that. And um, in the Principia, he, he failed to solve the problem for three bodies, the Earth, Moon, and the Sun. 
And it turns out no one has solved that since. Three bodies are in problem, uh, impossible to solve by hand. Even computers struggle. And that's the problem here with this orbit. You have Elon Musk's car orbiting in the gravitational field of the sun, the Earth, and all the other planets, and we don't know where the hell it's going to end up. So they simulated many orbits, and they tried to look at where Elon Musk's car is going to end up. So this is the probability of colliding with different objects. So the green here, well, there's a 10% chance it's going to collide into the sun. Yeah, there's a good chance it's going to collide with Venus, but the highest probability it's going to actually come back to Earth and hit us smack bang where it came from. And that, you know, thanks, Elon. <laughs> we don't want your car landing on, landing on us. You know, things, things drop out the sky, and it's not good because the, you know, one of the last big things to drop out the sky happened in Chelyabinsk in Russia in 2013. And you know, this is some car video, web, you know, car cam stuff. Shit. This is what a space thing hitting the Earth looks like. It, it creates a shock wave that it actually it damaged 7,000 buildings. It injured one and a half thousand people. It's a space rock about 20 meters across. Now, you may be asking why there are so many videos of this event. It's because every car in Russia has a car cam because they're such terrible drivers. They're all drunk. And, and if you search you know, YouTube for Russian car cams, it, it, you, you, it's terrible. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. So this is a 20-meter asteroid landing in Russia. And it created a lot of damage. And Okay, we have a graph, bit of science. So here we have the, the frequency of things that hit the Earth versus the size of the thing that hits the Earth here. And on the top is the energy. So every hour, a one meter size space rock hits our planet. Every day, something a few meters across hits our planet every day. That has the energy equivalent to an atomic bomb. So every day there's an atomic bomb hitting our atmosphere. And luckily, we have an atmosphere. So what happens is these rocks that are you know, one to 10 meters across, anything smaller than that, they enter the atmosphere. The shock wave heats up the, the, the atmosphere in front of it, and the, um, it just, the friction breaks the rock into pieces, and the rock tends to not make it to the Earth's surface. Until you get to about a size of 30 or 40 or 50 meter sized objects. So this here is the Tunguska Russian um, comet or asteroid that destroyed an enormous forest in Siberia, and it's thought to be about 50 meters across. And that's about the size of a hydrogen bomb. Some of the, the largest explosions ever made on our planet. And those, once you get to that size and above, they will make it through the atmosphere and land on Earth's surface and start to, to, to create a lot of damage. So every thousand years, you have something larger than 100 meters across making it to Earth's surface, and it, it will make a kilometer, it will make a crater on, on Earth a kilometer across or so. And then once you get down to this end, you see that the frequency falls off because there are less and less big objects. But once you get down to a million years or so, the objects hitting Earth are about a kilometer across. And these are the, these are the objects that can create real chaos, extinction events. They will, they will lead to a loss of many of the species on Earth and not be very, not, not be a good time when that happens. So what, <clears throat> and um, you know, we, we know this because we can look at the moon. On the moon's surface, there's a record of, of what's landed. 
This is a picture from an orbiting satellite, and you see craters within craters and all different sizes, from kilometers to hundreds of meters across. And if you, even if you go down to the, the astronaut's footstep, you still see tiny little micrometeorite impacts scattered. So the, the, the entire moon surface has been pulverized from hundreds of kilometer scales down to millimeter scales. But on Earth, our atmosphere saves us from a lot of the small things. So if we look, if we look at the sort of the Russian-sized object that came in in the last 20 years or so, these are the bolide events, the, the fireball events that burn up in the atmosphere, create these shock waves that can blow the windows out of buildings, and they have the energy of a nuclear bomb coming into its atmosphere. But they, our the air pressure around us saves us from, from those. And there's a lot of them all over the place, the random, day and night, they're coming in. Without our atmosphere, you know, there's no way we could be here. If you go to the bigger objects that come in and make it through the atmosphere and leave craters behind, then this is their distribution. These are the measured impact craters on Earth. And th these are known events going back the last billion years. And there's less than on the moon because you know, the moon has no atmosphere, no rain or anything. But what do you learn from this? Obviously, you learn not to live in Australia because there's a lot happening there. There are many reasons, there are many really good reasons not to live in Australia. Not the only one that Australians are crazy people and they have crazy killing you know, animals there that you don't want to live. But that is definitely not the place to live. You know, even you know, here we are in Switzerland, you know, France has been hit and Germany, but it's not so bad. Yeah, North America deserves to be hit, but that's okay. <laughs> now, the reason for this, you know, this is on the moon. You have a it's uniform because there's no weather, there's no climate, there's no rain. On, on the Earth, the continents move around. Actually, the real reason that Australia looks like this bad is because it's never changed. There's no plate tectonics down here. It just sits there. It's just sat there for the last billion years. Nothing's happened. It's like what goes on in Australia, really. Whereas over here in Europe, there's you know Alps being formed and all, all of the craters get erased. But this one here in the Yucatan happened about 65 million years ago. That was the last big one, the really big one. That this this was the impact crater that led to the to the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Um, the Chicxulub. Club. Create impact crater. Very hard to find. You can only find these things by doing gravity anomaly searches and looking for the for the tectikes, the glass that's that's created in the impact process. But on the coast of the Yucatan here, there's a 200 kilometer crater that was created by a, an, an asteroid about 10 or 20 kilometers across. And uh, this 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 impact crater, it blew up dust and, and rocks into the atmosphere. And across the entire planet, there's, this, there's a band of, of, of rock here separating um, the Cretaceous tertiary layer, the KT boundary. And that boundary here is filled with an element called uh, iridium. And iridium is really only found in asteroids. And that was the evidence in the 1980s that this band of ash and dust came from an asteroid impact that globally encompassed our planet and led to the extinction of, of, of many species. And this, this is a plot showing the number of genres, the number of creatures alive at a certain time going back in the past. And 65 million years ago, there was a big drop when about 30 or 40% of all living creatures died on Earth, including the dinosaurs. And that was thanks to this um, giant asteroid impact. So, with all of these things coming in, you would think that you know we would be able to detect them and predict them. Well, we couldn't for the Russian event. This was quite unpredicted. This space rock just came in. Nobody expected it. And the reason is it's hard to find them. So if we look at, over time at the number of near-Earth objects that could hit our planet, they're being discovered more and more. That started off in 1999. This is 2009. Each dot on here is an orbiting killer asteroid. Our Earth's orbit is here. And by 2018, this, this is all the known objects now. We've, we've, astronomers have managed to detect a, a number of them. And, and there's an awful lot. There's an awful lot of things floating around there. And it, it's, it's a little bit... 
we've only, astronomers have only find, found 25% of all the things that could lead to the extinction of life on Earth. So 75% of asteroids that could impact the Earth, creating chaos, have not been found yet. And, and it's just a question of money. It doesn't cost much money, but people like to spend money on other things like flamethrowers. <laughs> but there are, you know, what, ha what would happen if, if we did find one of these things coming in? Well, there are plans. There's the, this is a NASA project. It was started in 2017 called DART. It's a, it's a kinetic impactor. It's a, it's a space rocket that is designed to be tested on a real asteroid orbiting the solar system and um, called a double astronaut reflection test. And it's, it, the idea is just to send something the size of a bus into the asteroid and deflect its orbit a little bit. And that's great. If, if you can predict a, you know, 50 years or 100 years in advance the trajectory of an asteroid, you could send a bus into it, even though it weighs 100,000 tons, and that would be enough to move its trajectory to just miss the Earth. But that's tricky because you know it, it takes you know this is only going to be launched in 2022, so that takes a little while to you know even get there, and you know it's not even clear that's going to work. So there is no real plan about what to do if we see an asteroid coming into an, an Earth-crossing orbit. Um, although there is a plan, and it was uh, a science fiction. It was a director, and this is again an, a little clip from um, one of the previous late night shows where I gave an award to the worst science fiction movie of the 20th century. And it, you know, Michael Bay, who, who you may have heard of, is, is he, he received my prize for the worst science fiction movie ever. I mean, Michael, fuck you, science Bay. He, <laughs> he, um, he, he directed a movie called Armageddon, which had Bruce Willis. And this was exactly the plot. You have this giant asteroid coming into Earth, and, of course, Bruce Willis is going to save the day. And the, the reason that he got the prize for the worst science fiction movie ever is that there's over a hundred really basic scientific flaws with his movie. And uh, I'll just show you a clip from that, just to, you know. Here's Bruce Willis. Here's Bruce Willis, and he's landed on the surface of the asteroid. Now, I can't pause it. But if you, if you notice, there's grass on the asteroid. <laughs> I'll play that again, because it, it's hilarious. I mean, <laughs> how, how, <laughs> how could he do this? <laughs> play. Oh, I knew this would work. Good on. Damn. I mean, oh, it's in space. <laughs> There's no atmosphere, no grass. Look. This is, this is the astronauts leaving the surface of the, of the asteroid now in, in their aeroplane, flying through the atmosphere of the asteroid. That's not how space rockets actually work. And, you know, Freedom has max thrust. No. Basically, every few minutes in this movie, Bruce Willis willing to sacrifice his life to save humanity by detonating a single hydrogen bomb in the center of an enormous asteroid to shatter it into pieces. It's, it's dramatic. It's cinematography at its best. Press it. Fantastic stuff. Now, you know, to break an asteroid. Now we can come back to this that I wanted to show. This is the world's biggest explosion that's ever been detonated. It, it's a SAR bomb, a Russian hydrogen bomb that was detonated in the 60s. The energy of that one explosion could power Switzerland for an entire year. And you can just, you can calculate how many of these it would take to actually split that asteroid. Bruce Willis dropped one of these into a crack. It would take 300 million of these to 
smashed that asteroid into pieces. And that's just another little scientific error. I mean, the cost of the movie production, $144 million was spent on that. And if they just asked a random astrophysicist, there's some in the audience here, and I know they would have been happy with some beer and pizza. And for $100, they could have got some sound advice on, on how to proceed. <laughs> Made it into a good movie. It could have been a good movie. What a shame. What they really needed, what you would really need for this event is you know, if there's an incoming asteroid, you need John McAllister. Now, this is John McAllister. He, he is the world's best player at asteroids. And if you remember this game, <laughs> maybe you're not as old as me, but I, I love this game. You know, it's an Atari game, and it, it, it made Atari. And, and this is John McAllister live in 2010 playing asteroids to get the world record. He basically gave a spaceship, and he, he, he's much better than, than Bruce Willis. Look at the number of lives he's got. He's, he's just blasting them away. You fly around. And you know, he, the previous world record was 41,338,000 points. And he broke it. How did he do it? He played for three days continuously. Three days. It's and you know, it's a room full of nerds, but we love them. I mean, this is great. I would do this if, if I had the time, too. I would love to play asteroids for three days. Now, he, how did he actually do that? He didn't stop. He didn't sleep. He had to pee. But he had so many, he was so good at it, he would build up so many lives there on the screen that he would just run to the bathroom, leave his spaceship there, and it would be blasted by asteroids, and he would run back and start playing again and build up his you need. I mean, so if there's ever an incoming asteroid, we need we need John McAllister. He is the man. <laughs> Three days, anyway. That's great. Okay, I'll end. I'll end. The, I I did promise not to play you a song of mine, but I will do. It's probably the worst song I ever made. It, I wrote this a few years ago, and it, I called it Tunguska after the giant asteroid impact. And it just shows you what an incoming asteroid looks like. And I'm going to have a glass of wine and listen to this horrible music. Unless you go into your nice Swiss bunker and don't look. Then you won't see it, but you'll still die. It's about 30 seconds left, so you better drink a good glass of wine now because it's your last chance. So you, you might think you're opening another bottle, but you've got 10 seconds left now. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to have been here tonight.